Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on behalf of the National Transit Institute. I want to welcome you and thank you for participating. NTI develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today's webinar is the National Transit Database 2021 uh, Safety and Security Non-Rail Mode Reporting. And we are very pleased to have as our presenters today, Ms. Ann Singleton and Mr. James Overbeek. Ann Singleton has been a senior safety and security analyst for the NTD program since 2009. And Ann has been involved with several FTA initiatives such as the State Safety Oversight Program, the Commuter Rail Safety Study, and the Transit Bus Safety and Security Program in a variety of roles. Prior to Ann's work with FTA, she was a software instructor and database developer. James Overbeek joined the NTD team in 2015. He is a graduate of Randolph-Macon College and currently works as a validation analyst for the safety and security module of the National Transit Database. During today's presentation, you can ask a question at any time by typing it in the Q&A box. If you do not see the box, you can enable it by clicking on the Q&A box on the Zoom controls, which are most likely at the bottom of your screen. If you have not already printed out a copy of the presentation that was emailed to you, I will be pasting the link in the chat box in just a bit. At this time, I will turn it over to Ann Singleton. Ann? Anyway, the goal is to familiarize NTD uh, safety and security reporting require, with the reporting requirements and the individual reporting forms that you'll use. As always, we hope that the knowledge you gain today will ha help make your job easier, and we sincerely appreciate your commitment to safety and security reporting. For those of you that report for purchase transportation providers, uh, also known in the system as PT type of service operations, please share this presentation with them so that they are aware of what you're required to report to NTD. Um, this presentation would also be helpful for those that provide data to you or for the, to you or for the department that gives you data. <clears throat> So today we're going to show you how to access the NTD system and navigate through the menus and forms. We'll discuss how setup is achieved in the system, and we will review safety package navigation and features. Then we're going to go through reporting on each one of the four safety and security reporting forms, including completing a typical collision report. As mentioned, James and I are your, instru are your instructors for today. Uh, Joe Eldridge, the NTD Operations Center Manager, and Murtaza, um, the Deputy Program Manager, will not be joining us today. Um, and I'm sorry, I, also, I forgot to mention Thomas Coleman. He's the NTD Program Manager, and he also will not be joining us today. Um, here's our contact information. Um, we'll also show this again at the end of the pre presentation. Um, and your safety contact, your safety analyst is also in the NTD system when you log into your system and you're on uh, uh, in either the annual or the safety and security reporting modules, you'll see our contact, your safety analyst contact information there as well. All right, so we're first going to have a brief overview of the NTD program, then we'll discuss the website and navigating within. In 1974, Congress established the National Transit Database Program as a means to collect information and statistics on transportation systems in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first data was collected in 1979 via paper reports. Since then, the NTD has evolved into the nation's primary source of information and statistics on transit systems. The NTD data that is used to, in a variety of ways to, to include publicly available data products, uh, which can be used for peer review, for example, industry performance reports to Congress and other federal agencies or departments, and the formulation of national policy. The data is also used to direct, support, and improve other FTA program initiatives and is used as a factor in the federal funding allocations. Agencies that are recipients or beneficiaries of urbanized area formula funds 
5307 and 5311 are required to report data with some exceptions. Both public and private providers are encouraged to voluntarily report as this will increase the federal grant allocation for the ur that the urbanized area receives. All reporters designated as full reporters are required to report monthly safety and security events meeting reporting thresholds. Agencies designated as small systems or rural tribal agencies uh, report safety and security data on an annual basis. How do we validate that your, your data? SNS 40 forms are read by the analyst to compare the event description against the data points in the report. In addition, all forms are periodically run through various system validation programs looking for common issues. If the analyst has questions or requests corrections, the analyst typically returns the form to the agency, but may also call or email you. Once corrections are made, the analyst reviews the forms again and will approve the submission if applicable. When you make a change to a report, be sure to always, always submit the form after you have completed your change. Saving without resubmitting does not alert the analyst to changes. It also prohibits that data from appearing in your SNS 20 CEO certification form that is generated at the beginning of, of the next year to certify data for the prior year. I know some people have a hesitancy about resubmitting because they think it looks late, but it, that's not the case, so don't be concerned about that. We do track when the form was originally submitted. Um, also, uh, always please notify your analyst whenever you need to delete a report that we haven't asked you to delete. So if you find a duplicate or whatever the case may be, um, just pop your analyst an email, so here's the event number, this is why I'm deleting it, and that way we can keep track of that. We do have to track all deleted reports. Otherwise, if we just happen upon it, we have to find what agency made the change and kind of a needle in a haystack kind of a thing. So we'd very much appreciate letting us know when you delete. All right, um, the various forms and reports do have specific deadlines. The SNS 50 monthly summaries are due on the last day of each month for the previous month's data. Um, for example, September data is due by August 31st. The NTD system sends automated late notices on the 1st and the 5th of each month if your data has not been submitted. Again, notice I'm saying submitted and not saved. Please note that a report that, um, as I just said that, excuse me, <laughs> if you do get a late notice, please check to make sure that all of your reports are submitted. It's fairly common for someone to write, to contact us and say, oh no, I did mine, they're all done, but then we see that they were only saved and not submitted, and the system's going to send that late notice. If the form's still not submitted by the 15th of the month, a third late notice will be sent by the analyst. If there are extenuating circumstances why you cannot report in a timely fashion, please advise your analyst, again, so that we can make note and we can potentially not send that third late notice. Uh, you're out sick, you're on medical leave, whatever the case may be. SNS 40 major event reports are due no later than 30 days after the date of the event. <clears throat> Failure to report um, required data can have severe consequences and could affect the agency's annual program funding. A failure to report can be submitted by an analyst to FTA for a variety of reasons, as you see listed here. Please remember to try and submit timely reports or let your analyst know if there are uh, any extenuating circumstances. So this is a screenshot of the National Transit Database homepage on the Federal Transit Administration website. On the left so side are several links indicated here by red arrows that we're going to discuss in the coming slides. The first of these links is called About the NTD. Uh, this section contains an overview of the NTD program, contact information, and help desk contact information. The NTD data, series, uh, data section provides access to published data products, including the safety and security time series files. <clears throat> um, 
current annual data profiles, monthly ridership statistics, and the National Transit Summaries and Trends uh, NTST document is also available on that site. Under reference materials, you'll notice there, uh, you'll find that there's a NTD glossary, uh, policy manuals, uh, quick reference guides, and information on training and conferences. <clears throat> All right, so you can click on either the NTD reporting tool or the, in the reporting login tool to get into the NTD program. Use your business email address in all lowercase all lowercase letters to log in. Users can change the password as often as they like, but the system requires a new password every 60 days. <clears throat> Passwords must consist of 12 to 20 characters, be comprised of at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one number, and or a special character, any three out of those four. If a user ID has not been used for 60 days, the system's going to lock the idea, ID. If you get locked out, you can try and gain access by clicking on the reset password link <clears throat> located um, beneath where you log in. Um, if you still can't use C or if you, you, gain, you gain access but you still can't see the normal options that you see, um, you may need to do an unlock request from the actions menu item. Um, and if you, of course, if you need assistance, you can give uh, any one of us a call, or you can also contact the help desk. <clears throat> the agency's user manager establishes a person's user role in the system. The user manager is also the point of contact if you need to have your user role changed. A person must be uniquely identified in only one role. There are six access levels for reporting an NTD. The CEO, CEO delegate, NTD contact, and editor have the highest levels of access and full functionality to include NTD annual forms, monthly ridership forms, and safety and security forms. CEOs and CEO delegates can also submit the agency's certification forms as well. There's a certification form for both the annual data and the safety and security data, though they're due at different times. Um, the safety contact can create, edit, delete, save, and submit safety and security forms only, and will also receive reporting late notices. The safety editor can create, edit, and save, but cannot submit data and cannot delete data. And then safety viewers can do only that, just view data. To log in on the NTD homepage, as we've already reviewed, you click on the NTD reporting tool, and then the first screen that you appear is shown here on the left, the warning, and then once you click on that uh, agree to the disclaimer, you see the boxes for you to enter your username and password. And then below that, you would see accordingly either a forgot your password option or perhaps a reset password option. <clears throat> With the launch of the new Sites interface last September, the first screen to appear will be similar to this screenshot. However, yours may look a little bit different based on the, the other uh, sites that you have access to. On this screen, you can bookmark the NTD, if that's the one that you go into most often, by clicking on the star. And that doing that, this, the only time this screen would appear again is if you had announcements that had to be acknowledged. Once you complete the login, this is a snapshot of the default home screen. You'll notice that there are menu options in the blue bar across the top, which we'll discuss more on the next slide. Beneath the FTA logo, <clears throat> you see you also have access to different modules in NTD, the annual module, monthly module, safety module, and then the profile. <clears throat> The Tasks menu shows you how many tasks are in your queue. Tasks are things that you need to do. For example, one of the tasks you may have is to manage any pending or incomplete SNS uh, safety forms. The Reports tab will display reports that are available to you based on your access level. First, click on this category, and in our case, to see safety reports, you would click on the Safety tab. There are two far uh, reports that you might find particularly helpful here. One is the historical lookup form, 
and this report will allow you to look at historical data, safety and security data in NTD for your agency back to 2012. Another report is the rate compared to industry rate report, which will compute and compare your agency incident, injury, and fatality rates against the industry average per 10 million unlinked passenger trips. Under the action menu option, there are no actions related to safety data reporting, but you may see actions depending again on your user role. <clears throat> the grid up in the upper right hand corner of your screen um, is, uh, gives you access to other FTA organizations such as the user management module, the state safety oversight um, reporting tool, uh, and, and so on, again, depending on your user access. The silhouette, the little headshot you see there uh, in the upper, upper right hand corner of your screen when you're logged in, is where you can access your Appian profile and your system settings. All right, so this is normally where we list any policy changes that we've had for the year, uh, for the coming year, for 2022, but we do not have any policy changes, so that's good news. Um, you may notice uh, in January when we launched the 2022 module, there could be some minor, fairly minor form changes. We have some um, on slate to be changed, but uh, at this point, I don't have dates for when those things, um, those form changes are going to launch. I don't think that they would be anything that anybody would have a lot of questions about, uh, but if you do, again, please feel free to reach out to uh, your analyst or either one of us. All right, so first we're gonna review safety and security setup, then talk a little bit more about navigation. Safety and security packages automatically generate at the beginning of a new calendar year based on the agency's previous reporting status. And by reporting status, I mean are they a full reporter, a reduced reporter, a small systems reporter, et cetera. Modes and types of services are available in the safety module are determined by the agency's P20 form. If you see unexpected changes to the modes or types of services or have any questions about the modes and types of services you see when your forms launch, contact the person in your agency who submits the annual reporting data. Uh, frequently, we see these changes at the beginning of a new fiscal year for an agency, the agency's fiscal year. Again, if you don't know who your annual reporter is or who's doing those reports in the system, um, you can contact us and we can certainly look into and let you know who you should contact. Um, one thing that you do not want to attempt to do is modify the P20 form. If you modify the modes that you see there, change a mode type or type, change a type of service, add in a mode, delete a mode, any of those actions are, could have serious consequences to your data and can cause all the safety and security reports you've put in for potentially the past year to just disappear. So please don't modify the P20. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so the safety and security forms. We have four forms as we've mentioned, so the SNS-20, as you can see here, I'm not gonna read the list to you, but the SNS-20 is your CEO certification form. This launches at uh, on January 15th of the following year. We'll get more into that in just a moment. Your SNS-30 is your security configuration forms, just done at the beginning of the year. Your SNS-40 major event forms are for each major event that you have meeting reporting criteria. And then your non-majors, um, generate for every mode, for every month, every mode and type of service for every month, and uh, collect only single injury safety events and non-major fires, which again, we'll talk more about momentarily. Okay, so as I mentioned on the Home tab, to get into the safety and security uh, uh, reporting module, you clicked on the safety uh, selection there. Um, you Right now, well, this shows that there are three years open, and I apologize, I should have changed this screenshot. There are, at the beginning of a new year, three years open for a short period of time, usually till about March, uh, April. Once we have all the agency's CEO certifications, we can close that module out, and then just as you would right now if you were in the system, you'd see only the two years, 2020 and 2021. 
So you can gain entry to that calendar year that you desire to go into by clicking on the folder, the blue folder name at the left-hand side. That's your agency's NTDID number, and that will get you directly into the form. You'll notice there's also a blue pencil on the right-hand side, which is supposed to be a shortcut. Uh, unfortunately, that's not quite working right now, um, so I would suggest using the, the full. It, does, it works. It just doesn't work as it's supposed to. So, uh, so it really could go in either way, but I, I think the folders you'd find be a little bit easier. Um, okay, there also is across the top, uh, though we really can't see it here. I'll show it to you later. There's a status bar across the top, so sometimes if you see a package is taking a moment uh, to load and you're wondering why, if you look across the top, you'd see a status bar, and it's showing you um, how far it has yet to go to get into that package. All right, so once we click on the safety module and we get into the year, <clears throat> excuse me, the first screen you see is called the landing page or the summary view. You'll see a confirmation of the reporting year that you're in, your agency's ID number and name, your validation analyst's name and email address, and your agency's, um, well, not the agency's fiscal year. It shows the fiscal year for safety and security reporting, which is always a calendar year. Um, below that, you'll see a, several filters. You see the form name filter box, uh, which limits the form types that you want to see if you only want to see SNS-40s or just SNS-50s. Along with that, you can also um, filter by the form status, and that's the status of the report. So you could filter by um, ones that are just returned. If you still want to see what has Ann sent back to me, um, then for, for changes. So you could filter to just what's returned or just what's um, open that still has to be submitted. And then, of course, you have your mode and type of service filter where you can see to uh, restrict your view to just seeing MBDO reports or just rail reports or, again, whatever the case may be. And these can all be used in conjunction with each other. You can also use, once you've kind of drilled down into that, if you're a large agency and have many reports, you can also use your Control F, just the web browser's find, and look for a specific ID number if you'd like. Uh, but you would have to be on the correct page that uh, that ID number would appear on. Uh, so you may want to sort in that case. And you can sort by any of the column headings. Oops, I didn't mean to click. Um, let me just go back. Um, you can click on any of these column headings here, and it will sort the information that you've filtered uh, in that sequence. A double click on that column heading will reverse sort it. All right. Um, the other button you see on the top of the screen, uh, this safety summary view or landing page, again, as we've called it, um, only allows you to view what's there. It doesn't actually let you interact with the forms themselves. To do that, you have to click on the NTD Safety Forms button in the upper, upper right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, so once you've done that and you've clicked on NTD Safety Forms, it takes you to the dashboard. And you'll notice the dashboard looks very similar. Again, you have contact information across the top. Um, and then you have, <clears throat> excuse me, then you have the uh, same form names and you have the same sorting capabilities that you normally was. Now I see that one thing I omitted off of this screenshot and I have to apologize, that's entirely my fault, is normally right about, if you can see where I'm wiggling my cursor, right beneath where it says safety form, safety report forms, there'll be a blue box here that says file new SNS 40 and that's what you use to generate a, uh, a new major event form. All right. So let's start looking at our forms. The first one we're going to look at is the CEO certification form. The CEO certification form certifies the data reported for the prior year is accurate. Um, this generates, as I mentioned a moment ago, on January 15th. The form automatically tallies submitted data uh, by mode and type of service and separates them into two categories of major events and non-major events. So for your major events, you'll see the number of events, the number of injuries, the number of fatalities, again, by mode and type of service, 
And for SNS 50 um, events, you'll see the safety events, the, the number of safety events, the number of fires, and the number of injuries, which, of course, would be equal to the number of safety events. Um, this form is due by the end of February. So agencies have about 45 days that they can get in there and certify the data and then request the CEO submit it. Only the CEO or the CEO delegate can submit it. This is another question we often get at that time of the year when we say, hey, we send you a late notice for your CEO certification and you tell me if you've saved it, but you can't submit it unless you're the CEO. So you'll need to make contact with that person and ask them to submit the form for you. However, you can uh, verify that the data matches what you've put in. So you can go into the form, you can look at the data, uh, you can say, you can actually have confirmation boxes that you can check and check it off and then tell the CEO that he or she is ready to submit it. If you, um, there are sources that you can use to help verify the data. You, you have your own records, of course. Uh, there's the historical lookup report. That, you, uh, that I just showed you um, or just spoke about a, a moment ago that you can look at to verify data. And uh, you could even, well, you could look in the time series data, but that combines major and non-major data, so it would not be quite as helpful. Um, another thing, again, if you don't see that the numbers are quite added up, you want to make sure that all of your SNS 50s uh, are submitted. Um, and SNS 40s should also be submitted but more importantly, should even show an approved option on it as well. Okay, and then all your CEO has to do once the confirmation boxes have been checked is just click on Submit, and that's it. Very simple form to use. This is a screenshot of what a typical uh, SNS-20 looks like. Here's your confirmation boxes, and again, this is where you can confirm the data by checking that off. And then your CEO, what you don't see down here is your CEO would have a submit box where he can submit the form into the system. Okay, uh, so that's the SNS-20. We're going to move into talking about the SNS-30 security configuration form. Okay, so the security configuration form uh, collects the number and type of security personnel employed or contracted by your agency. The form is completed once at the beginning of the year and you're not required to update it during the year. You do have a new mode or type of service that you're starting to report for. You will see a new form generated for that and that would have to be completed before you could continue to do any reporting at all. <clears throat> so all SNS 30s are required to be submitted. As I just said, uh, all SNS-30s are required, and uh, without all of the SNS-30s submitted, again, the system is going to block any reporting, safety and security reporting whatsoever. Um, again, giving the agencies typically a month or so to get their data in. SNS-30 forms are due by the end of February, and that's because your January data is also due by the end of February. You'd want to take care of the SNS-30s ahead of time. Okay, so this is a sample of the SNS-30 uh, uh, form, and you'll see that there's a place where you put in the number of primary personnel, number of secondary personnel, which we're going to talk about momentarily. <clears throat> you have a selection of the type of personnel that they are, whether they're uh, your own agency's uh, force or whether you just use local police. And then, of course, your save and submit buttons. All right, so primary and secondary forces. The primary security force is the one that routinely responds to events and or is assigned to patrol transit agency property. The secondary security force is the one or ones that occasionally responds or responds when the primary force requires assistance. Whenever you're using uh, the option of use of local police non-contracted, we only select a, a quantity of zero for that. And this is just because if you're using local police, obviously you may not know how many people are in the local police department, and of course you don't know how many would respond. So we just use zero. 
the number of personnel is reported in full-time equivalent hours. So one FTE equals one person working a 40-hour week or 2,080 hours per year. So you prorate the number of personnel if the person works only part-time providing transit security or if they provide transit security for more than one mode. <clears throat> and one SNS-30 is completed for each mode and type of service. Be careful not to double count personnel. The number of the, to, uh, the number for the total number of security personnel box on the SNS-30 form should equal the total number of agency personnel. For example, um, as you see here, let's say we've assigned 1.5 uh, FTE for our motor bus uh, purchase transportation. We've assigned you've assigned three personnel to your light rail uh, mode and type of service, and then you reported. 0.5 personnel for your demand response. So that means that the agency's total security personnel equals five full-time equivalents. If your security force co covers multiple modes, you may use any reasonable method of determining FTEs. That may be modal ridership, which is a common denominator, or the number of employees covering a particular mode. If an agency contracts for security and pays a monthly fee based on services used, they should determine the FTE based on the previous year's total hours worked. <clears throat> NTD allows for only one primary personnel type. If your agency has more than one type of security personnel it considers primary, report the security force with the largest number of personnel as the primary and the smaller force as secondary. For further information on the SNS-30, you can review the safety and security policy avail uh, manual that's available online as we discussed earlier under reference materials. Or of course, you can ask your analyst, uh, safety analyst for, safety, for uh, assistance. All right, let's take a look at the non-major report. Uh, the de definition of a reportable event is, as you see, a safety or security event occurring on the transit right-of-way or infrastructure at a transit revenue facility, at a transit maintenance facility, during a transit-related maintenance activity, or it involves a transit revenue vehicle. These safety events must meet the single injury-only threshold and are related to falls, electric shock, smoke, etc. If the safety event results in multiple injuries, the event is bumped up to a major report. The SNS-50 form also collects the number of non-major fires where there was no evacuation, no injury, no fatality, no property damage, but the fire still required suppression. There are some exclusions to the non-major events <clears throat> which are events occurring at bus stops or shelters that are not on transit-owned property unless the person uh, it involves a person that is boarding or alighting at the time of the event. And OSHA events occurring in administrative buildings are also excluded. So, for example, if a person is injured at a bus bench out on a city street, maybe they're assaulted or they fell down or whatever the case may be. That is not reportable because it's not on transit-owned property and that bench or the bus stop pole is not considered transit property. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, transport of an individual solely for mental health evaluation unrelated to a specific event or due to a person stating that they wish to harm themselves where there's no evident injury uh, or those transported solely for intoxication or drug overdose are not reportable at all either. The forms automatically generated for each mode and type of service at the beginning of each month. This form is also required to be completed even if there was a major event for the month as they capture different event types and even if there's no data to report for the month. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
There's one caveat to this. Those that report for commuter rail do not, and the Alaska Railroad, excuse me, uh, do not report um, on the SNS-50 forms. It only collects uh, safety data, and uh, commuter rail and Alaska Railroad only report security incidents. Okay, so uh, the other safety occurrence not otherwise classified, that's what OSINOC means, section captures <clears throat> excuse me, the number of occurrences that occurred for the month, remember this is a collection for the entire month, um, and the matching number of injured parties. Remember that injured to NTD means that the person was transported away from the scene for medical attention regardless of whether or not they appear to be injured. Do not include people that were not transported away from the scene for medical attention. Um, there's several examples here, as you see listed, um, of events that you would report on the SNS-50 form. Okay, so this is the typical um, non-rail SNS-50 form. The rail and non-rail are minutely different, only in that the rail version of this form for your light rail or heavy rail modes, of course, they would see that in our class on Thursday, but they've moved the fires up to the top on that form. That's the only difference. So you're just indicating basically where the person uh, was injured and the person type. So how many occurrences happened and how many are injured uh, patrons or passengers, workers, or other injuries other people. Um, all right, so go to the next screen here. Two of the categories on the SNS-50 form relate to securement issues. Securement issues are those that are related to an injury resulting from improper securement of a mobility device, such as a wheelchair or a scooter. <clears throat> so they are reported under the selection that says other in vehicle securement issue. The other category that says not a securement issue, these are to collect slips, trips, or falls while the person is on the vehicle, or perhaps they were thrown from their seat during a vehicle maneuver, such as a hard brake. Complete one form for each mode and type of service. If no qualifying safety events or non-major fires occurred for the mode in the month, then the appropriate SNS-50 form, uh, you'll, there'll be a form option there for no data to report. So you would just click no data to report checkbox and then save and submit the report. Again, they're still required even if nothing happened on your non-major forms. Um, uh, again, remember not to include any injuries due to collisions or security events on this form. Again, it's only listed, it's only for slips, trips, and falls. Uh, and I'm just going to interject that the, we often see, especially with new reporters, and that's why I hope all of our new reporters are in this training session, um, that someone will consider a minor collision and, um, you know, the person was injured in that minor little fender bender, and they'll put it here on the SNS-50. So please don't do that. <laughs> you, collisions that meet a reporting threshold that we'll talk about or James is going to go into shortly – are always reported on the major event form and never on the SNS-50 form. Okay, um, there uh, we do, of course, have questionable data sometimes. Um, if we see an in-vehicle selection with an other person listed, we're going to question who this other person is that's not a worker or not a passenger on your train, your uh, your <laughs> bus. Um, also, if we see a location as a non-revenue facility or an other location with a patron injury, we're going to question that too. And this is actually one of the form changes we're hoping to have in January because it will actually present a little box um, where you can type in who this person is. But unfortunately, we don't have that just yet. So, um, so again, we may send this back, and all you need to do is just answer our, our question, and then we'll tell you whether it's appropriate for the form or not, and we may ask you to remove it. All right, so your SNS-30 forms and SNS-50 forms can be modified at any time. 
Some reporters like to enter events as they occur during the month. And for those reporters, they can go in and put in the entry for something that happened that day. They're not ready to submit it to us yet, so they can just save it. We're not going to review the forms if it's just saved. Um, so as we mentioned again, uh, we may return a report for you uh, to you for questions <clears throat> or to make a change. And uh, this can be done by the return form. When we use the return feature in the system, it's going to return it back to the person that last submitted that form. So that's why you may receive that email. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> that's it. I'm sorry, I guess I was thinking of something else, but I think we're good with that. All right, so at this point, I'm going to turn this over to James to take you into major event reporting. Thank you, Anne. Let's take a look at the, uh, as Anne just mentioned, let's take a look at the major event reporting. Applicability is the same as for the SNS 50s, but let's uh, look at this in more detail. A reportable event is a safety or security event occurring on transit right of way or infrastructure at a transit revenue facility, at a maintenance facility or yard, during a transit related maintenance activity, or involving a transit revenue vehicle and meets a reporting threshold. There are some exclusions to the applicability, such as events that occur off transit property where persons, vehicles, or objects come to rest on transit property after the event. OSHA events in administration, administration buildings, death from illness, drug overdose, or natural causes, including those found deceased, other events such as assault, robberies, non-transit vehicle collisions occurring at bus stops or shelters, not on transit-owned property, unless it involves a person boarding or alighting or involving a transit revenue vehicle, a non-revenue service vehicle, supervisor or police vehicle collisions that occur while traveling to or from a transit-related maintenance activity while operating on public roads. Um, thresholds, fatality confirmed within 30 days, which includes suicides, one or more persons immediately transported for medical attention, which is an injury, property damage equal to or exceeding $25,000, an evacuation of a transit facility or vehicle for life safety reasons, and a collision involving transit roadway revenue vehicles, which result in either the transit roadway vehicle or a non-transit roadway vehicle being towed away from the scene regardless of the severity of damage. Here are a few examples of events that are reportable to NTD. Two people who are still standing when the transit vehicle starts moving, both fall and are injured. This would be reported as an Osinox slip trip or fall major event because two people were injured during this slip, trip, or fall. If a deadheading or out-of-service vehicle is involved in a collision, or there is a fire in a bus garage meeting a reporting threshold, these will be reportable. Maintenance-related activities are included in reporting. Here you see a few examples of maintenance-related activities that are reportable. Less severe injuries to maintenance workers are captured on the SNS 50 monthly summary report, along with non-major injuries to passengers and patrons. Now we have some examples of events that are not reportable, such as employees injured on a city street or other property that is not transit owned property. A person is waiting at a bus stop and is hit by a car is not reportable since the person was not on transit controlled property. An assault or robbery that occurs if the person is boarding or alighting at the time. You will remember that part of the event definition states involving a transit revenue vehicle. However, NTD also collects non-transit collision incidents such as an accident in transit parking lots that meet a threshold. And then there are a few examples provided.
Fatalities. A fatality is a death confirmed within 30 days of a transit-related event. This includes transit-related suicides. Police do not include deaths resulting from illness, drug overdoses, or natural causes, including found deceased on transit property, where it is not a result of a collision or suicide. The next threshold is injuries. An injured person is a person transported immediately away from the scene for medical attention. This includes transport by ambulance, private vehicle, or any other means. There are a number of exclusions to include a person walking away from the scene for medical attention is not considered injured. Medical attention must be sought without delay after the event. Medical attention must be administered at a location other than where the event occurred meaning that a minor first aid given at the scene is not considered injured. Um, here are a few more exclusions. Medical attention due to illness should not be reported. For example, a passenger on a bus has a seizure and is transported to the hospital would not be reportable. Also, the exclusions regarding mental health evaluations, declarations of self-harm, Intoxication and overdoses are excluded, just as we mentioned in the SNS-50 form. Now the property damage threshold. Events with total actual or estimated property damage equal to or exceeding $25,000 are automatically reportable. Property damage includes transit vehicle and non-transit vehicle damage, damage to transit stations, bus stop signs, and shelters if applicable. The cost of non-transit property, private property, buildings, fences, is included and also the cost of clearing the wreckage. NTD requires only general or ballpark estimates and you may use a variety of methods for estimating. There's blue book values, repair amounts, or insurance estimates, Establish standard property damage estimates for specific event types or severity of damage. Many transit agencies create a list of standardized costs. Or these estimates may be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Estimated damage includes personal property such as laptops, cell phones, investigation costs, medical claims, or litigation. Property damage must always be reported on SNS-40s regardless of amount, including zero damage. If there is a collision involving a transit roadway revenue vehicle, which results in either the transit revenue vehicle or non-transit vehicle being towed, the event is automatically reportable regardless of any other threshold. This is limited to roadway vehicles and therefore excludes ferry boats and trains. For example, a transit bus and a car collide, there are no injuries or fatalities and property damage is only $1,000. But the car is towed from the seed the scene due to disabling damage, the event is reportable. The tollway is not based on the severity of the damage. All evacuations for life safety reasons are reportable. Life safety means there's imminent danger to all people in that environment. This includes both directed or customer self-evacuations. Self-evacuations are where customers vacate the property without direction of the transit agency or other authority. Some examples of life safety reasons are suspicious packages, bomb threats, a smoke event, fire, fuel fumes, noxious odors, or a person with a weapon on a transit vehicle. If a bus has a transmission problem and, tr and passengers are evacuated to the sidewalk or shoulder, the transmission problem is not a potentially unsafe situation and therefore is not reportable. Evacuations are not common for collisions. There would need to be a fuel leak or a similar life safety situation. As a reminder, to create a major event report, navigate to the home menu option, then choose safety option and choose the appropriate calendar year and click on the folder at the left. Unlike the SNS-50 form, the SNS-40 is not out automatically generated and you only create an SNS-40 if there is a reportable event. 
To create the form, click on the NTD Safety Forms button located in the upper right corner to access the dashboard. To add a new report, just click on the File New SNS 40 button. Just a reminder that SNS 40 reports are due no later than 30 days after the date of the event. If you have an event to report that includes two or more transit modes from your agency, how do you choose which mode to report under? If the event involved your rail mode and a non-rail mode, choose rail. For example, one of your light rail vehicle and one of your buses collide. Report the incident only once under the light rail mode. If the event is between two non-rail modes, use the predominant use rule, which is typically based on ridership. For example, if a bus and a paratransit vehicle collide, report the event under the bus mode since it has higher ridership. The first two screens will act as a wizard to help determine if the events meet the threshold. Screen one captures the date of the event, the mode, and the type of service, and the event type. This is a, a snapshot of setup screen one. The first and most common is a collision, followed by fires, hazmat spills, acts of nature, and other safety events that meet a threshold. Each of these will be discussed in more detail later in the presentation. There are two categories of security events. There are system security, such as, a, such as arson, bomb threats, suspicious packages, etc. Basically, they are events that affect the transit system. The second type is personal security events, such as assaults, robberies, homicides, rape, etc., that affect one or more persons. The second setup screen asks you a series of questions, some of which are based on the mode and or type of, of event you are reporting. This is to determine the reportability of the event and the subforms that need to be generated. This is only a list that will cover each in more detail. First is the number of injuries and or fatalities. Then the total estimated property damage amount. The screen asks about an evacuation threshold question. If the event type is a collision, then you are also asked the tow-away threshold question. You will also be asked if transit revenue vehicles were involved, which determines if this is a transit or non-transit collision. This is a snapshot of setup screen two for the non-rail mode collisions. As I mentioned, if you chose collision on screen one, then screen two captures if there were transit revenue vehicles involved in this event. Select yes if this is true, which includes purchase transportation vehicles as a transit vehicle since you are reporting for this service. You would select no when the collision involves a private vehicle on transit property or a transit non-revenue vehicle collision occurs on transit property. These are typically maintenance vehicle collisions that meet a threshold. Based on the selection you have made and questions you have answered, the system will respond accordingly. If the event is reportable as a major event, the basic information screen will appear. If the event is not reportable as a major event, the system will generate a message that is that the event is not reportable and ask you if you want to continue. At this point, you can edit the selections on setup screen two in case you answered any questions incorrectly, which may have made the event seem not reportable. If the event meets the criteria for a major event, the basic information screen will appear next. The basic information screen displays the date you already selected. When entering the time, be sure to use AM or PM designations, even if you use military or 24 hour clock format. The approximate or actual location of the event the geographic location, longitude, and latitude is required. You are permitted to enter numbers, a decimal point, and a negative symbol for the longitude. 
please use a minimum of four decimal places. If you do not have the coordinates, you can use a variety of internet sources. One such site is latlong.net. This is a snapshot of latlong.net if you choose to use it. As you can see, there's a box to enter the physical address or the station name or milepost, and the system will display the coordinates in the latitude and longitude boxes. The basic information screen also captures the event description. The description box can hold 2,000 characters. If you exceed the 2,000 character limit, a message will pop up that you exceeded the limit and you will not be able to continue to the next screen until you reduce the number of characters. The description should be concise but descriptive so that the analyst can understand what occurred, how it occurred, and, in, and should include the number and type of injuries or fatalities, and if any vehicle was towed. Also, please refrain from using codes such as IV to refer to a vehicle or using vehicle as vehicle one or vehicle two. The analyst has to be able to determine who hit whom and how, and not all reporters refer, refer to IV as the transit vehicle. You may have noticed the event description did not include any personally identifiable information such as names, addresses, badge or driver's license numbers and so on. However, do continue to include ages and genders. This helps us validate your reports. The basic information screen now includes attempted suicide and suicide checkboxes when the event type is a collision. This is corroborated by the same checkbox on the injury or fatality form. The last piece of information is the name and phone number of someone to contact for additional information regarding the event. You do not need to enter the name of the person if they are the person reporting the event. When you enter a phone number, enter only the numbers and no parentheses or dots. The field will self-format. The basic information screen is also the first bar appears on. This bar shows you how many subsections you have to complete and your progress thus far. This is a snapshot of the basic information screen. As you can see here with my cursor, here's the progress bar. First, we will review the details of reporting a collision. The collision screens will vary slightly depending on selection on setup screen two. Typically, there are four screens or subforms that may appear when reporting a transit collision. The collision event information screen, the collision information screen, then the transit vehicle involved information screen, and if applicable, the other vehicle involved information screen will appear. This is a snapshot of the collision event screen for non-rail modes. So the first collision screen is the collision event information screen. For all the modes, this captures information about the number of transit vehicles involved. The answer would always be one unless two transit vehicles from your agency collide. The location of the event, such as the transit station, roadway intersection, roadway grade crossing, bus or service stop, non-revenue facility, which would be a transit bus barn, yard or maintenance facility, et cetera. Bus or service stop is appropriate location for modes such as demand response, paratransit, pickup at a person's home. <coughs> Continue on, continuing on with locations, ramps, streets, highways, and freeways are reported as roadway, not a grade crossing or intersection. Please do not select other and type in highway or freeway. Other is used for parking or private property. Grade crossings are locations where rail tracks and vehicular traffic intersect. Parking lot entrances, exits, and driveways are not reported as intersections. Use the roadway, not a grade crossing or intersection location. For the collision with selection, indicate what the transit vehicle collided with 
such as another vehicle, person, animal, fixed object, and so on. A collision with a bicyclist, pedicab, a person in a wheelchair, or an electric scooter is reported as a collision with a person. Larger scooters like small motorcycles, mopeds, and motorcycles, school buses, or dump trucks are all reported as a collision with a motor vehicle. Use the other selection only when no other selection is appropriate. In a multiple impact collision scenario, report the collision with as the first object impacted. For example, a bus collides with a car and then the car hits a building. The collision with selection would be motor vehicle and you would include the damages to the building and that the building was struck in the event description. The last selection is the number of other non-transit vehicles that were involved in the collision. Please note this box is not the total number of vehicles in the collision. It is only the number of non-transit vehicles involved. So please do not include the transit vehicle in this number. Let's look at a few examples of how to determine how many other vehicles to report. If car one cuts off a bus but no contact is made, and the bus goes on to hit car two, the number of other vehicles to report is one because only car two had contact. Car one hits car two, then car two hits the bus. The number of other vehicles to report is two. Again, both car one and car two made contact. NTD also collects non-transit collisions such as an accident in transit parking lot or with transit property. The event must meet a reportable threshold. Here are a few examples you can read through. For the number of other vehicles selection, enter the total number of non-revenue or private vehicles involved. The non-transit collision form will appear when you select the collision event type on setup screen one and select no to the question were transit revenue vehicles involved in this collision on setup screen two. After the collision event information screen, the next screen to appear is the collision information screen. This is a snapshot of the first part of the collision information screen. The collision information screen captures information about the conditions at the scene. The collision information screen captures information about the conditions at the scene, such as weather and lighting conditions at the time of the collision. The twilight selection is used to refer to both dawn and dusk when it is not full light or full dark out. Please be sure your lighting corroborates the AM PM time you entered on the basic information screen. Indoors is not used to indicate street lights or lights at a station platform. Here are some considerations when reporting the roadway configuration. You would select limited access highway to report an incident on the freeway. A limited access highway has access limited in some way. For example, it may not allow pedestrians or bicycles. Please be sure that the location chosen on the collision event information screen is corroborated here on the collision information form. If you choose roadway intersection or grade crossing, the system will generate the categories for the intersection control and grade crossing control devices if applicable. Based on your location, one of these categories will always be not applicable. The control device selection is used only if there is no control device on any side of the intersection. If your report does not include the information, you can look it up on Google Maps. At this point, we have completed the collision event information screen. The next screen to be presented collects information about the transit vehicle involved. One screen will appear for each transit vehicle involved. The form includes an identifier count and buttons for increasing or decreasing the number of vehicles. This is the transit vehicle involved screen.
The form captures the vehicle type, information about the type and manufacturer of the revenue vehicle involved, the vehicle action at the time of the collision. The collision type is captured for all modes. This is the part of the transit vehicle that was impacted, the speed at the time of the collision, and a question asking if the vehicle was towed due to disabling damage. The fleet involved section integrates with your agency's most current A30 revenue vehicle inventory form. There are separate A30 forms for each mode and type of service. With this integration, you will choose a vehicle from a list of available options. When the selection is made, the vehicle and fuel types are already part of the selection, thus eliminating making an incorrect selection. If you are operating a new manufacturer that is not in the A30, you'll have an option to add the vehicle into the form. However, adding a vehicle to the collision form does not update the A30 form itself. If you have questions about an A30, please contact the person at your agency who completes the form. This is a screenshot after clicking on existing fleet button. The grid displays the available options from your A30 for the mode you are reporting with columns representing pertinent data. Some agencies may have selections, so you can use one of the four filter boxes to reduce the grid to show only certain ID numbers, certain vehicle types or vehicle manufacturers. To select a vehicle from the fleet, click on the checkbox located to the left of each option, then click on add fleet button at the bottom. Once the selection is added, the total vehicles and active fleet vehicles column shown here will disappear and the agency fleet ID will appear, which would be more beneficial as part of the record and for reporters for vehicle identification. If the vehicle is not listed with the existing fleet, the user may add a new vehicle by clicking on the new fleet button. The grid will display drop-down boxes to select a vehicle type, vehicle manufacturer, and vehicle fuel type. These are lists of all possible options unrestricted to the agency's A30. After making your selections, click on Add Fleet. This is a screenshot after clicking on the Add Fleet button. If you need to make a correction, click on the red X under the Remove column heading and start over. We'll now explore some of the transit vehicle action options. When the transit vehicle is moving into or out of a scheduled service stop, report the action as either making a transit stop or leaving a transit stop accordingly and report the transit vehicle speed to indicate the vehicle was moving. Do not choose this option if the vehicle was not moving. If you choose the stopped or parked option, be sure to report the vehicle speed as zero. The vehicle speed must be reported even if it is zero. This diagram shows most of the impact points which are reported from the point of the view of the transit vehicle. Let's look at the options in more detail. Rear-ended means that the rear of the vehicle hit the front of another vehicle. Rear-ending means that the vehicle traveling forward hits the rear of another vehicle. Please do not report this action as head-on or other front impact. Rear-ending and rear-ended must be reported as a pair. Side impact means that the transit vehicle was impacted anywhere on its side, including the door, the mirrors, or the tires, with the exception of when a side swipe occurs. Other front impact is used when the front of the transit vehicle is impacted, but not when it would be considered head-on or rear-ending. An example would be the front corner bumper hits another vehicle or object while turning, not the bumper on the side at the front. Likewise, other rear impact is used when the transit vehicle or other vehicle is impacted on the rear, but not when it would be considered rear-ended. An example would be if the transit vehicle was backing up and hit a utility pole.
Sideswipe is used when two vehicles are parallel to each other, going in either the same or opposite directions and bump and scrape along the sides of each other. Both vehicles would be reported as sideswipe. Please note that sideswipe cannot be the action chosen when you are reporting a collision with a person. Instead, use side impact. When reporting a T-bone or broadside collision, one vehicle is reported as head-on and the other vehicles reported as side impact. So in the diagram, vehicle number one, the other motor vehicle, would be reported as head-on, and the transit vehicle, number two, would be reported as side impact. And multiple vehicle accidents or chain reaction accidents can be a challenge to report. Remember to consider the first impact or collision type in your analysis. In this diagram, vehicle one would be reported as rear-ending, it's doing the hitting, which means that vehicle two was rear-ended, which then caused vehicle two to be pushed into vehicle three, the transit vehicle, which would also be reported as rear-ended. Remember, it's the first point of contact. For the speed, enter the actual speed of the transit vehicle at the time of the collision. If the speed is unknown, you can use the posted speed for that section of the road, and if needed, adjust that speed based on traffic and or road conditions at the time of the incident. The last selection on the form is, was this vehicle towed from the scene due to disabling damage incurred as a result of the collision? Answer yes or no accordingly. If you indicated on the collision event screen that another vehicle was involved, the other vehicle information screen will appear. This screen gathers information about non-transit vehicles or vehicles involved in the collision. If more than one vehicle, more than one other vehicle is involved, you will need to complete one other vehicle involved information form for each motor vehicle involved. Vehicle counts are included on the form as well as options to add or remove vehicles. This is a screenshot of the other vehicle involved screen for non-rail collision reporting. The form collects the type of other vehicle. The form includes an option for a non-revenue rail vehicle. The automobile option would be used for both cars and passenger vans like a Dodge Caravan, for example. The action of a physical movement or other vehicle of the other vehicle at the time of the collision is also collected. Just as when reporting the transit vehicle collision type, you are indicating the part of the vehicle that was hit from the point of view of the other vehicle. The form includes the question, was this vehicle towed from the scene due to disabling damage incurred as a result of the collision? Answer yes or no accordingly. Please select no if the vehicle was towed because the operator was taken away of the vehicle and just wanted it towed. It must be due to disabling damage, even though that may only be a flat tire. This then would conclude the collision information screen. If your event includes an injury or fatality, you will need to complete a screen for each person. This form also includes a person count and buttons for increasing or decreasing the number of people. Person type location categories are divided into two groups, person outside the vehicle and person inside the vehicle. Transit vehicle rider is the correct choice for passengers boarding or lighting. Pedestrian walking along road also includes walking along tracks. The form also includes an attempted suicide and a trespasser checkbox on the injury form and suicide and a trespasser checkbox on the fatality form. Please be sure to select the location and all checkboxes accordingly. Trespassers are people in unauthorized areas, typically in facilities, just as with attempted suicides, if there are police reports, eyewitness statements, etc., to an account for trespassing, please include the information in the event description. 
Using the word trespasser or trespassing is very helpful to the analyst. Trespassing events are not reported on the event level and trespassing is not a threshold. Rather, we collect trespasser injuries or fatalities. This is a snapshot of the fatality form. Notice the operator can be either inside or outside vehicles. This is a very common mistake for someone to choose the operator option from outside the vehicle during a vehicle collision. This is a snapshot of the injury form. Point out operator inside and outside vehicles. Very com Once again, this is a very common mistake for someone to choose the operator option from outside the vehicle. Thank you, James. <clears throat> um, I want to let you know that I've seen some questions come in, and for some reason the system is not allowing me to uh, answer that question. Um, so I thought I'd just take a quick moment and just answer the two questions I saw. Uh, one was asking, if I believe it was correctly, uh, it was asking if there were any uh, more slides that discuss changes from 2020. Uh, um, and uh, in this, because we didn't have, this was presenting changes for 2022, which we didn't have any, but if you want to see changes for from 2020 to 2021, then you would want to look at the policy manual available online. Um, and the other question that came in is, what was the most effective technology for data collection and analysis? Um, and every agency is different on how they collect their data. Um, one of the things I would say um, is that most most of the agencies do get police reports. Um, so I, I guess they've established a rapport with their local police departments in the, in the jurisdictions that they uh, have operations in. Uh, so that would be one source. And if I'm not properly answering your question, uh, please feel free to um, give me a call after the uh, after the presentation. Um, just really quickly also, and then I'll let James take over the chat box. Hopefully he can do it. <laughs> uh, uh, is there a new quick reference guide? The 2022 uh, quick reference guides have not been pub published, published yet. Uh, the 2021 quick reference guide is available. Again, if you go to where the policy manual is, if you go to that link, um, the, the reference guides will be on the lower left-hand side, and you'll see them listed there. Okay, so now we're going to get into reporting evacuations and um, other non-collision event forms. All right, um, so uh, James went over evacuations kind of on a high level, so we're going to talk about them in a little bit more deep detail. Evacuations can be included in any event type, but are less common in collisions. If an evacuation is incorrectly included or excluded, you cannot add or delete it from the report. Um, you would have to delete the entire report and then create a new report with or without the um, evacuation in it. So be careful when you're answering that question on setup screen two. The evacuation subform includes verification question to confirm the evacuation was for a life safety or potential life safety situation. Uh, please do not answer no to that question because then you're telling me this is not an evacuation for life safety and then that means you would have to delete that evacuation, which again means you would have to delete the report and then create a whole new one. All right, so this is a uh, screenshot of the evacuation subform. It's a fairly simple form, as you see, just a few options to select there. This is that confirmation question. You don't ever want to say no to this because we'll make you do the report over again. And then where, what, uh, what was evacuated and whether or not it was a self-evacuation. <clears throat> In the evacuation details box that we just saw, you would include a brief description of the evacuation, including the cause. Um, 
what was evacuated, again, is your location to indicate what was uh, evacuated. Sometimes more than one thing is evacuated. So if it's like a a train or a revenue facility, uh, think about maybe what was evacuated first or where the cause was. Was the fire in the station or was the fire in the train? Uh, So that will help you fill out that section of the form. And then the last question, as James mentioned, uh, is was this a self-evacuation? And again, self-evacuations are exactly what they say. People took themselves off of the vehicle for whatever the reason was. It was not directed by the transit agency or uh, responders, police, so on. All right, fires, major fires. To be behind as a fire, the incident must have fire suppression in some way, either by equipment or by personnel, and must meet a major event threshold. Without these thresholds, the fire requiring suppression is reported on the SNS 50 non-major summary report form. Arson is reported on screen one as a security event and not as fire. The presence of smoke with no flames, no fire suppression, is reported as an other safety event. And there'll be an option within that form, as you'll see in a moment, for smoke situations. So this is a screenshot of the fire event details screen. We're going to go over these selections in more detail in the next screen. Uh, If the fire is in or on the vehicle, including in the engine, the wheel area, or anywhere on the outside, this would be reported as the option, the location of in or on vehicle. Report the type or cause of the fire. And then for the fuel type selection, you would choose the location of the fire as, you know, again in this example, as in vehicle, but then you would also report the fuel type for the vehicle. If the fuel, if the fire was not on the vehicle or in the vehicle, you don't choose a fuel type. You just choose not applicable. Acts of God or uh, acts of nature are natural or unavoidable catastrophes that affect the transit environment. Select all the locations of the property damage, injuries, and evacuations. You'll be able to choose more than one option on this form. For example, um, a location should indicate the uh, the property or the properties that were damaged and not the geographic location, such as the name of a city. This is the Act of God form. All right, hazmat spills. When you're reporting a hazardous material spill, the spill must meet a reportable threshold have caused imminent danger to life, health, or the environment, and required a specialized cleanup crew. A couple of examples is what of a couple of examples of what is not a hazmat event would be things like some oil or brake fluid or transmission fluid um, emitting from a transit vehicle. It would not meet enough fluid to to meet a threshold. And for, uh, and this is actually from a real event we had many years ago, uh, a bleach container carried onto a vehicle breaks open and the vehicle is evacuated to fumes. Now, while it's still reported, it's not reported as a hazardous material spill. That would be reported as an other safety event because no specialized clean, cleanup crew would be required. So this is a sample of the hazmat screen. Okay, we, um, there's also two different types of security incidents, um, a system security event and personal security events. Of course, they also have to meet a threshold like all of our events. System security events occur on transit property and affect the transit system as a whole. Personal security events happen to individuals on transit property or those boarding or lighting a transit vehicle. This is where you could report a suicide or attempted suicide that did not involve impact with the transit vehicle. This is a screenshot of the system security event screen. So it has different types of events from the personal, as you'll see in just a moment. Uh, You will notice that there is an other system security event. 
Uh, this could be used for shots fired in an area or random um, people throwing bricks at the, a bus or things like that. They just don't fit into other categories. And then your personal security events. And again, there's an other um, personal security event type too uh, here. And this could be maybe an officer is injured uh, when he's um, arresting someone wasn't necessarily assaulted, but he hurt himself while he was arresting a subject. So that could be another security event, other personal security event. All right. And then finally, we also have other safety events. Um, this is kind of your miscellaneous uh, category. These events must meet uh, one of the, the following thresholds, as you can see here, one or more fatalities, two or more injured, property damage of $25,000 or more, or an evacuation. Um, please, uh, you can report another safety event with one injury, but then there would have to be another threshold. If you have another safety event that's only one injury, and that's it, as, as we mentioned earlier, that gets reported on the SNS 50. All right, so here are some examples. Uh, you can see an evacuation of transit property due to smoke, fumes, or noxious odors, uh, a fatality on transit properties that was not considered a collision or a suicide, perhaps you fell down the stairs, or electrocution. Um, people, uh, two people thrown from their seats due to a hard brake or other type of vehicle maneuver. Three people injured when an escalator comes to an abrupt stop. So on. And again, just reiterating, single injury safety events are reported on the SNS 50 when there's no other threshold. And this is a screenshot of the other safety event screen. Okay. So we're going to talk about saving and submitting, submitting your reports, and we're going to talk about editing as well. At any point from the basic information screen on, the system automatically saves your report. So if you close the report without saving or submitting from this point on, this basic information screen on, these are auto-saved as pending reports, which are stored on the task menu. Uh, so that's up on your task menu option. When you're ready to complete that report, Perhaps you went out of it deliberately. Maybe you realized you didn't have all the information you needed to complete the form, but you don't want to start all over again. So again, if you leave that without saving, um, it'll be a pending task. So you can open your task menu. You'll see it listed there. It'll say SNS 40 um, event, and you can click on it, and it'll take you right back into the form where you left off. So this way now you can complete it and then save and submit it. Or if you no longer need that uh, pending task, you can just delete the form instead. Save and submit options appear when you are in the view form mode. If you do not see a save or submit button, you would want to click on the view form button that's located at the bottom of the screen. Uh, once you click on save, the report is saved and it's given an event number which will be at the top of the report. The review the report also stays open so that you can continue to review it. Once you submit the report, the report uh, will close and it'll return you back to the dashboard. Um, submitting a report again releases the report to the validation analyst for review and comment. It also notifies the analyst that a report has been created or edited. Every time one is submitted, the analyst gets an email telling us that this report's been either submitted for the first time or it's been changed. Uh, again, I can't reiterate enough, unsubmitted reports are excluded from your injury and fatality counts and your event counts on your SNS-20CO certification forms. Um, again, I think we've already mentioned that uh, if uh, we have any questions about a report, we're going to use that return box, at the, the comment box, excuse me, at the bottom of the report and send it back to you for corrections or questions that we may have. And again, that email is going to go to the person that was listed as the last modified user 
on the uh, dashboard. All right, so here's an example of a um, comment box. <clears throat> Excuse me. The comment box is included on all the forms with the exception of the SNS-20 form. Um, uh, each time the form is returned, it's given a timestamp. Users may respond to request using the comment box, but you don't have to. You don't have to, for instance, say, hey, I made the changes. Uh, obviously, we'll see you made the changes, but if you only made one change or you couldn't make a change or you feel the information doesn't need to be changed, if it's correct, for example, uh, again, this is something that you could put in the comment box and basically send it back to us by resubmitting it. <clears throat> um, when reviewing or editing your reports, it's important to learn how to move around within the document. So uh, when you're in the, in the system, you're going to see a list of the options like you see here. You'll see a close button, a next screen. I think these are all pretty much self-explanatory. The view form button and the jump to section shortcuts I think are particularly um, important. Um, the, uh, the view form button, again, is located at the bottom. That brings up the whole report in a grayed out fashion. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to review the whole port. Make sure your data points match each other. You've said it's an intersection there. It matches down at the lower part where you say it's also an intersection. The time matches the lighting, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also when you need to edit. Um, important bu bu uh, choose. Excuse me, I can't talk. <laughs> the important button here is these jump to buttons. The form on the right hand side when you're in view form mode only will show you these jump to sections. So you can jump to the injury section or jump to the transit vehicle section and then make your correction. Um, and then when you're not in a view form mo mode, um, you can just use your next or back buttons to navigate around the form. Um, when you open the, the uh, report, the first screen that appears is the setup summary view. This screen is the only place where you can edit the date of the event. So if that's a change that you need to make, this is where you would want to do it. It's also the only place where you can change the property damage. And if there's no injuries or fatalities in the report, you forgot to include them, perhaps, this is the only place you're going to be able to add those injuries and fatalities. So it's the very first screen before you get to that view form mode. If you instinctively clicked on next and went to the view form mode, now you're going to have to, to go back and change that data property damage, for example. You're going to have to close the report and go back in. Um, okay. Um, again, just as a reminder, uh, as a back kind of a back throw to the um, access levels that we talked about earlier, if you don't see a submit button, that means that, and you're in the view form mode, which is where they appear, it's because you may not have permission rights to submit reports. And if you need submission rights, then you can certainly talk to your user manager, or if you have any questions about this, of course, please uh, let us know. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, if you delete a report that was not requested by your analyst, please notify the analyst that you are deleting a report. Again, perhaps it was a duplicate that was entered, perhaps by someone else in the agency. Um, but we keep records on the total number of events and total number of events for agencies. And uh, it just makes it a whole lot easier for your safety analyst to figure out who deleted something uh, rather than trying to, to search for, through and see where it happened. Um, okay. And so we're going to go back to questions and answers. Um, and here, again, is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to, uh, to either one of us if you're not sure who your analyst is. So I see that there's a question in the box. It looks like James is answering. Okay, James, if you want, I can go ahead and answer that verbally. Yeah, I just answered okay. it, but if you wanted, to, I mean, it's a good one for everyone to okay. know. Yeah, okay. So um, 
the, the question was, if two people fell on the vehicle due to a sudden stop, should it be reported on the SNS 50 form? And yes, that's right. And then how exactly would you report it? Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're exactly right. I misread it. If two people fell in a vehicle due to a sudden stop, would it be reported on the SNS 50? And no, it would not, as James said. That only collects single injury, slip trips, and falls. If two or more people fall in that sudden stop, it gets bumped up to a major event. And on um, when you're choosing your type on the first screen, you choose it as an other safety event. Sorry about that. I <laughs> the wrong mode there with my brain. All right. Any other questions? Open. Recent submission for our agency robbery by gunman on the bus then forces the victim off the vehicle. The operator has other passengers alight. SNS 40. Yes, that would be correct. Your evacuation for life safety reasons due to this presence of the gunman. And so um, that would be an SNS 40. And that would be, well, it's a robbery. So we go as a robbery. If the robbery was, I, I shouldn't say if it was successful. This is what was the intent was. This is what would be reported. That be added to the scenario for the next manual revision. Um, question was Elizabeth. I have a feeling it's in regards to the two injury slip trip or fall question. Oh. Trisha, I'm looking back as maybe Elizabeth, if that had to do with the um, 2021 quick reference guides. I'm not in um, the place where I can look at that right now, but they should be on when you go to the 2021 policy manual and you click on that link, not actually opening the manual, but on that where it shows you the link for that um, Adobe document. Down in the lower left, there should be a place where it says quick reference guides. And the 2021 should be there. Uh, if it's not, again, I'll take a look after the call, but I'm not sure of your number, so you could certainly give me a call, and we'll take a look at that. And if not, I can just send you on. So. Okay, so I see a question. Is that only if passengers are transported? Um, for your... Uh, Okay, first let me say that rail and non-rail is different. Okay, so for my reporters that are only reporting for non-rail modes, um, when you're reporting passengers, you're reporting injuries, yes, it's only for people that are transported for medical attention away from the scene. Is there a spreadsheet you like us to record our participation in? Um, no, the uh, NTI captures all of the participants um, and also captures these question and answers, which helps us a great deal to modify our training and, and manuals to make sure we get everything. Uh, but there's no spreadsheet you need to, uh, to complete. But they will have, um, uh, Solyndria will mention an evaluation form um, for, for, the, for evaluating the course itself. Let's see. Um, I have um, multiple vehicles Anne? involved. In, yeah. Hi, Anne. It's Lori. Um, I just I didn't know if you were aware we're 15 minutes over. Do you want to keep going or oh. encourage everyone to email the analysts with any more questions that they have? Uh, okay. Well, um, let me do that real quick in two minutes. How about that? And if that's anybody fine. else has anything past the anonymous that's on there, then just email either James or or I, and we will. Um, take care of your questions. If multiple vehicles are involved in a collision, only include the vehicle that hit the bus or include all vehicles. You include all vehicles involved in the collision. So if you've got a car that rear ends another car and that car rear ends the bus, you include all of those vehicles, all three of them. Uh, let's see, if a passenger it was struck by the bus before boarding, is this an SNS 40? Absolutely, that's a collision. The person was struck by the bus. If the bus is moving, and that's it, it would have to be moving in order to strike the person, I would assume. Now, if the person walked into the side of a, a bus that's not moving, it goes on the SNS 50. All right. After that, 
uh, please, again, just reach out to either James or myself, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, everyone. Yep, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I did forget this one. It came earlier. What was, oh, no, I, did, I think I did go over to the police reports, didn't I? Did I talk about that, James? I believe so. Okay, okay. If not, give us a call. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much, Ann. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Very special thank you to Ann Singleton and James Overbeek for the very informative presentation. Uh, just a reminder, as Ann said, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out our evaluation for this event. NTI always greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you once again, everyone, and be safe. Take care.